dollars to donuts with your host, Steve Portugal. Thanks for joining me on Dollars to Donuts, the podcast where I talk with people who lead user research in their organization. As a consultant, I find myself collaborating with very different types of organizations in terms of the amount of experience they have in doing user research or learning from user research or acting on what we learn from doing user research. There might be strong leadership in user experience design or product design or service design, or or that might be a completely foreign concept. That's a significant challenge in my work as a consultant, ensuring that I'm in a position to assess and respond to that diversity. It's also something that I really enjoy, and I see working on this podcast as part of that journey, something that I'm able to share with you. And so the best way to support this podcast is to support my own consulting business. You can hire me to lead user research projects or to coach your own team as you talk to users. I help organizations put together research roadmaps so they can prioritize their limited resources. And I run training workshops to level up field work and analysis skills. Please get in touch to see what we might do together. Otherwise, if you have feedback about this podcast, email me at donuts at portugal.com or write me on Twitter at dollars to donuts. That's D-O-L-L-R-S. T-O-D-O-N-U-T-S. I was intrigued by a story on NPR last month about a program created at a VA hospital in Madison, Wisconsin, called My Life, My Story. In this program, staff and trained volunteers conduct open-ended interviews with veterans about their lives, letting the patient decide what they want to share about themselves. The interview is turned into a thousand-word biography that the patient reviews and revises and then is included in their medical record. Patients also can share these stories with friends and family. This particular VA hospital has been training other hospitals in the VA system over the past few years. The article describes the benefit to the patient and the different caregivers, both in the act of telling the story and in having this kind of softer information available for review in their medical record. The article also explains the evolution of the My Life, My Story program, and and how they, quote, tried having patients fill out surveys, which were useful but still left the team wanting more. Next, they tried getting patients to write down their life stories themselves, but not many people really wanted to. Finally, an epiphany. Hire a writer to interview the patients and put what they learned on paper. This is a primordial form of user research. There's no sense-making of patterns across groups of users. The data gathered from a user of the system only has value when applied directly to that user's specific experience. I mean, maybe there's a cultural shift that comes from making this kind of information available in the medical record itself. Maybe it invites providers to be hungry for this kind of data. Maybe it changes the conversations internally around patients as people with rich and messy lives beyond their medical conditions. And I want to dismiss it as unscalable, this idea of interviewing every single user rather than a sample. But look at the implementation here. It's absolutely about operationalizing it so that this service, asking open-ended questions about a patient's life, is a component of the experience for each patient. In some ways, it's a bit threatening to user researchers that the simple act of just asking people about themselves can benefit the delivery of services so significantly. But on the other hand, it also suggests that the potential value researchers can bring is well beyond what we usually say it is. If you're looking towards the future of user research, this may be an early signal for possible directions. Let's get to the interview with Michelle Merritt, who is leading user experience research for CBRE Build in New York City. Well, thank you for being on the podcast. (laughs) Happy to be here, Steve. Let's start with an introduction. Who are you? What do you do? So my name is Michelle Merritt. I am currently a lead UX researcher at CBRE, and I'm working to build up a research center of excellence in the Seattle office. What, what kind of business is CBRE? 
CBRE does commercial real estate. You've probably seen their names on buildings, especially if in, you're in bigger cities. But if you're doing retail or industrial and logistics types of work, you might see them. And if you're searching for office space, you might have encountered them from a broker and advisory perspective. So CBR is what what part of CBRE are you are okay. you working so on? So I'm I'm working with a group called, called CBRE Build, and it sprung from an acquisition that happened approximately two years ago when they they acquired a company named Floored that specialized in 2D and 3D visualization tools that were really helping brokers to help sell to help sell their buildings and spaces. And so those tools are still in existence, but since then my my manager has been tasked with creating more of an innovation group and they've they've created other tools that complement the original 2D and 3D tools as well as tools that help people calculate and and, and anticipate space that they might need, tools that help work with test fits and that can be used by people beyond brokers and landlords and more for helping you really figure out uh, the right space for your needs. It's still focused on commercial real estate. So is this kind of a product tools part of a larger real estate organization? It's a digital and technology section okay. of a larger company that's focused on commercial real estate. Wow. Okay. And, and um, a fun word to talk about is prop tech or property tech. Mm. So we are very much in the property and prop tech space. If you if you see that, and some people might think it's a buzzword, but it's what's happening with other parts of the industries. As you've seen, um, other groups, financial went through this, healthcare is going through this, even consumer, uh, commercial real estate, as well as other parts, even in your home and consumer real estate is finally getting more interactive. It's more tech savvy. And so some of these things are finally coming to commercial real estate. Right. I think the New York Times keeps writing about how, and I don't know if this is tech exactly, but uh, like companies like Zillow will now buy your house as yep. well as tell you what it's worth. And there's some technology yes. that makes yes. that happen. So is that prop tech? That's prop tech. Okay. Yes. Wow. So pro yeah, prop tech can be consumer for you looking for a house, an apartment. It's also um, in commercial real estate. And, um, and yeah, so it's all, all different things. Anything that helps take data, technology, and information and, ma and make it more innovative and probably disrupting the status quo of what you've probably been buying and selling real estate for hundreds of years the same way. We're kind of at that inflection point um, if for, for tech now, yeah. for real estate. Okay. Oh, that's great context. And then you mentioned, um, I think you mentioned Center of Excellence. Yes. Is that right? So yeah. what does that mean? So, um, so most centers of excellence are business, business terms that have been around here. What we're trying to do is, one, build a group. So there's more researchers. There was only, I think, a researcher who'd come from support. Be before I joined, there was one or, one or two people in other parts. We're certainly adding more trained and skilled researchers as part one, build, literally building the team. Part two, we are creating templates and processes so that anybody, whether they're a trained researcher or a person who does re research, Search PWDR can actually leverage some of our tools. They can get started very quickly. They can find the right participants. They can use our templates. They can use interview guides, and they can probably execute a basic research plan on their own. And then the third component is understanding who else in the company is doing research, making sure that we're connecting with them and building this community so that we can continue to grow our research center of practice, but also to share, like, if we're actually talking to brokers and the same people all across the company, we can share what we've learned and we start, we can start to share journey maps. We can start to share new insights and then try to really understand, does it differ by geography? Does it differ by region or something else? So that we start building on a shared platform of insights and not redoing work that somebody else already did. What's the process, you know, when you come into an organization, you want to find, yeah. I don't know, these sort of pockets yeah. or different areas. How do you go about doing that? So I somehow I was able to connect with the person in Seattle who introduced me to somebody in Dallas. And we initially just said we're going to have essentially a meeting. That meeting that I thought was only going to be three people has now been a monthly meeting that's grown to five, probably five to eight with a few people. We've now had designers who are basically doing research. We have a product manager who is actually doing his own research and is a huge advocate for research who is attending that. And so based on those meetings and others, they've invited us 
Um, in one case, we spoke at a lunch and learn. In another case, we were a guest. We were kind of a guest speaker or guest attendee at other meetings, and people have started to find us and either say, "Oh, we have." you know, 73 personas on this topic, or we don't know if we, we think we have 73 personas, we can't find them, but you should talk to this person. And so that's how it's been, I would say, very grassroots, but we've established kind of this monthly meetup and we at least know a handful of people that are here and who to reach out to. And we're getting the word out. People sometimes reach out to us. So does that step outside of the, originally you're sort of describing where CBRE Build is yeah, and sort of what its mission is. Are you right. now making these connections outside of that? Yeah. Okay. So I'm making the connections um, outside of CBRE Build. My, my mission is definitely to establish the New York City office as a center of excellence for user research, but also as in so doing, because we're under the same umbrella, the digital and tech team umbrella, that part of that is just elevating everybody else and also to do our job. So it makes sense for us to talk to people in other locations and other parts of the business because of the overlaps. What, uh, you know, what was going on at the organization where there was, I don't know, there's, you know, in the time when you were talking about, you know, being part of CBRE Build, there's obviously some desire or hunger yeah. or some sense that something's, there's more that we could be doing. Do you, I know that's sort of yeah. before you were here, but right. like I'm wondering, what are the conditions that set up for, you know, a, a, a willingness to, to drive the kind of work that you're doing for them now? Well, I, I think that the, the company has always embraced um, user-centered design and understanding the users. All the product managers that I interviewed with and spoke to, they were they were doing, you know, the best that they could with user user research. Sometimes they certainly hired outside contractors to, to execute research. So there was already that interest in the user, user research. People were doing their own jobs to be done. They were already, um, you know, again, doing their own interviews. And some people had taken UX classes or had some background in user research. And similarly, uh, there were designers here that were also doing what, what we would call user research. And so there was already, I think, a good uh, platform having product managers and designers who are trying to make their products better for the user, not just not just a technolo- technology play. And so I think that that was, that was really exciting. And um, it was also what attracted me is that it's not, it wasn't um, simply the end side of a project that they wanted. They also wanted help uh, starting to develop MVPs and being more experimental. Like, is the, we have some insights. Can we make something? Is this really the right fit? Okay, great. You know, it is, or it, it it's not quite, we need to go back to the drawing board and tweak that a little bit and then get into building it right. So the fact that they were talking a lot about that and doing more innovative processes and were open to experimentation, that, that made me want to come here. It makes yeah. me think about like what's, you know, when researchers are looking at organizations to see if they want to join yeah, them. Right. Some of the things that you mentioned were about, were not research specific, but yeah. how are products being made? So right, right. you're looking for sort of the context that's going to make the research that you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. So were, were, were there designers here and actually at the same time, uh, we're, they're since hiring, they are going to be hiring a new design director, but there was already the foundation of the designers in this office. And then there was, um, I had a sense of there may be other designs in other pockets of the organization. I didn't know to what extent, but the fact that they, um, I'm not sure when I heard about it, but I definitely understood they were, they were trying to improve product development on all levels, research uh, from formal from formal design as well as well as product management. So they had, they had those tools. You know, you mentioned... Um one of sort of the, the three different things you're doing was uh, around uh, building tools for people who do research PWDR. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you have a perspective on, I mean, I think this question of who does research and, and what do we do as researchers to support that or right. to, you know, do you have a, is there a philosophy or a, or a goal kind of beneath that for you that you think about? Uh, the, the philosophy I think is that the trained researchers should be taking on the most 
the most critical, you know, places in most risky projects. And that's where they can really also add the most value is, are they going to lose a lot of money? Is this a totally new workflow? Is this really new to the world? Um, to really focus trained researchers in that area. I believe that once um, people are more familiar with some of the usability basics and they under, they really, if they really embrace, like we really want to understand which concepts are resonating better, which aspects of the concepts, and they do it with an open mindset that they can start to get to get feedback on a concept. Uh, one of my favorite stories um, involves a designer where originally I think I'd led several of the sessions, so he kind of understood my script for one point, and then he was able, we set him up, so he was going to lead the sessions with um, these other participants who were recruited. They already met the criteria. And I remember him coming back and he said he just kept showing them the concepts. And I think it was probably three or four. And then he said they just weren't getting it. And then he kind of, he commuted on the on the bus. So he went home on the bus and he like redid something based on all those things. And he he redid the concept based on the feedback. So I think, and then, it, and then eventually it worked. It tested better. But the fact that he, even on his own, exposed three or four people without me saying like, can you do this? Can you do this? And like three or four people couldn't. And he finally understood there was some issue with the concept and it wasn't about him and it wasn't about them, but that he needed to take that information and redesign it. Like that's my favorite story because we set it up. He had my original script. He didn't have to find the people, but he got that insight and and redesigned it. So that's my favorite story of someone maybe who isn't trained, but being in the right circumstances and then being able to act on it was was able to do that. <laughs> That's great. I mean, that is a good example of sort of setting people up to be successful. Right. And yeah, you didn't you didn't need to be there for that. Right. So you could do something else. Right. But he was also very aware and the fact that he was then motivated to be like, oh, wow, it really, really isn't working. You know, let me see how I can rework this. And that he was humble enough to say, not have ego or anything, but to really say, okay, something doesn't make sense, you know. <laughs> right, because you can experience those research sessions in different ways. Yeah. You know, like even that phrase, right. they aren't getting it, yeah. starts to point outward. Right, but right, right. But I think it was that he had to do um, the fact that he also persisted and did all the sessions and then realized, okay, there's some, maybe, and maybe, and I don't know, I'm, I'm again, this is several years ago, but I, I remember the essence of that. And so I think that, you know, if you can set, if you can help set that up, I, th I believe in helping find participants. I've done this in, in other cases where we're going to say it is easy to find participants Sometimes you might have a dedicated recruiter. Sometimes you have a research ops person. Or we're, um, I do believe there's still skill involved in getting the right people, but that having some of that infrastructure around can help say, okay, everybody doesn't have to worry about that load. I don't think that other people should be necessarily taking on. There's a lot of skill that goes involved in recruiting. So I think research or research ops can help say, we're going to find the people. We are also going to help you write your script. And if you do this, and essentially you're looking, this is what you're looking for. And also having enough people in the room. I also believe in watching, having uh, people that are going to do that. If they've watched professional researchers do this, if they've been in enough sessions, they understand essentially, hopefully what, what they're looking for, what they're not. I, I wouldn't throw somebody in with, without any training. They also can reuse scripts. Like in some cases I've done automate, I've done a lot of automated usability testing. And so again, they usually designers and product managers love that because they can watch the people do things on a real screen. They're not even having to worry about writing the prompts. You know, they're maybe reusing or rewriting a prompt that I wrote or another researcher wrote, and then they can go back and, and watch that. And usually those are also really insightful for the designers to, to watch that and also to watch it. Um, what I feel uh, this is making me think is another thing where it's very focused. I think that other people doing research, um, some automated research is really good or even their own. If it's super focused, it's very ABC. Could they get from A to B to C? No, they got lost. Okay, that is easy to identify. Where it gets really complex, where I think there's a lot of interactions, that's where you probably need a team. You need more dedicated researchers. But I definitely think that things like that can be, um, people can be trained to do that. So what are some of the, you know, the most impactful tools or processes or things that you've yeah. set up to help these folks? 
Um, so we're, we're still in the process of setting up, um, we we're calling it kind of a, like a research wiki off, off that research wiki. We, we start out, we're having templates. We have past, um, surveys and details that you can reuse or surveys with the details of like sample questions. If this is an automated study, if it's a survey, here's, here's what those questions look like so that it's starting to be a little bit more self-service. We have, um, we're starting to link any journey maps, any personas that were done for projects that actually this might relate to your project. So we're trying, we're making sure we're not calling it by the project name or a code name, but calling it, you know, here's this type of person, making sure that anybody else can can find that, you know. And so we're setting up, I'm basically uh, hacking Google Docs to make a, a series of mini wikis, but it seems to be working. And then um, on one project, we actually uh, have gone so far as reusing Airtable and making Airtable to kind of um, capture some of the feedback from from key elements. And that's been, that's something that's still, um, I guess, under development, but the product manager actually loved Airtable and she had set something up before. And because Airtable is really like a giant spreadsheet, I was able to say, well, here's where I would put in um, a few recordings, here's some clips, here's some evidence um, that I would also add as, a, as I find it. And we were doing something that lasted over several months and we got into the habit of at least trying to add one or two lines with maybe keywords um, that we could do, that we could put into Airtable. And what a really nice outcome of that is we've now been able to link those Airtable um, nuggets and pieces of information to Clubhouse tickets, which is where there are design and engineering tickets. And so we've been able to um, re- re-look at what's an error table and say, oh, these things all relate to a certain topic or a theme. We can create a link. And then when an engineer or designer is working on that, we can send them that link that it literally has all the evidence, at least at a high level. And if they ever wanted to know more, they can go back to here's the entire survey. Here's this entire you know, research report or something like that, but it's all off that link. And so I think that that was exciting for me because of the impact of finally having a process, at least on one project where sometimes in the past they've gone into repositories, but they weren't always linked at the time to a design or an engineering ticket. Sometimes there was a lot of re- rewriting. And so this is something that's in progress. Um, we hope we do a blog post and, and share it out, but it's working for this one project. If it's scalable, we, we'd love to share some best practices and learn from that. Right. I mean, you mentioned repository, yeah. and that seems to be sort of a trigger word in the user yes. research field right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think a research repository is definitely a trigger word. I had the, the opportunity to work with Timur Sharon, who started uh, Polaris at WeWork, and I was one of the, the people that did not create Polaris as much as tried using it as a dedicated researcher and providing tweaks for some of the early information that was in there. Um, some of you may or may not know it, that Polaris started as an Airtable base before we created at WeWork that we created a homemade tool. Um, and so I believe that some of the lessons that I learned from working on Airtable there and le- learning from working on the homemade tool, Pol- Polaris, I was able to apply here. What I took from that was still making sure there are single line items that can stand on their own as kind of a summary or a keyword like, you know, the participant did not understand this word. They used this word instead of that word, things like that, things that are very self-explanatory to anybody reading. And then if there is evidence, is it a screenshot? Is it a record? Is it a link to a recording, even with a timestamp? Sometimes we can put in a little bit of a clip of like, hey, the, the user really had trouble doing that, that that went into Airtable. And then at least being able to search by keywords. Sometimes I was prioritizing it by impact to user. Was it critical? It's really going to be a showstopper. Is it moderate? They're going to kind of muddle through, you know, they can put they, it's not a showstopper. And then minor, it's going to impact them and irritate them. And so putting in at the very least. And then also what the designers and the product manager loved is making sure there was an area for notes or ideas, because sometimes people have ideas. And I think that you should be able to capture that at the time. Maybe it's, you know, we really, we don't have this in help and not that you want to rely on help, but in some cases, 
it can be like, we want to make sure that they're looking for this keyword and help because they all use this keyword. So make sure it's there. Or we really, they use this other competitor tool. Here's the ideas we should really, or they use the consumer tool and the consumer tool reminded them of this tool. We, we should look into that. So making sure we can capture all that. Because of how it is, it hasn't been as, for me, it's been challenged. We have we have some verbatim, some surveys. That was great to add into Airtable, but I also had to add high level summaries of surveys or items that were maybe not as conducive to Airtable. So we're essentially hacking Airtable to make this repository. And for that reason, that's why I think it's not complete. I still kind of have a research wiki, which is really like, oh, you're looking for the personas for the project. You're looking for, oh, here were some key key things that we did. I did um, a buy a feature type of a workshop once with some participants to really help us prioritize other features. That didn't lend itself well to Airtable, but we have the people recorded saying, hey, this is valuable. It isn't. So I feel like the research repositories bogged down um, because there isn't a good, the way in order for them to be useful, one, you have to fill it. And two, you're not always getting the same types of input. Sometimes it really is observing people. And even if you've got the transcript, you still need the context of what feature were they trying to buy to add like really, really meaningful things if I was to do that into Airtable and for it to make sense at some other point. So I think like there's room for growth in terms of research repositories, but at least I have a link to, hey, we did this. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, if anyone's considering these 10 features, go back and at least look at some of these notes. You know, we have people prioritizing that. So I think that there's so many different types of research and the repositories to make it perfect. I don't know if it's possible. Are there processes that you need to put in place either on the I don't know, is it fair to call it production consumption? I mean, there's sort of different users yeah. of these repositories, but. So I think, yeah, a lot of it was tasked with, again, definitely the product manager who, who already loved Airtable myself, trying to be what I, what I wound up doing is making sure if I had verbatims that would add value, that at least those verbatims got into that. I know that it's always, it's challenging. I think what'll help is making a, a form for if people do have other things, we do have kind of our, our some of our engineering and production teams who are catching bugs and catching other feedback or even something that doesn't seem right. So there's a way to create a form to add that. And that's been, that's been really good too. I think also, um, I know that other product managers are using Airtable, but I'm not sure how they're doing that. And I think it's also, I know it's time consuming, even if you, you know, like I said, even if you get the transcript, you still have to translate it into something that's meaningful. So I think, you know, making sure that it's useful, it, it's not going to weigh you down as you do your projects. So having every product manager enter it, I don't know if that's, if that's reasonable. I, as a researcher, I certainly can't enter everything either. And that's what I'm saying. Like I'm linking, hey, we did this awesome buy a feature priority exercise, but I did not. We have like spreadsheets, we have videos. I didn't have time certainly to do that. And also we'd moved on like that. I think that's the nature of some of the repositories. Like, oh, great. We, we did that week. We prioritized, we learned from it. There's some high level takeaways, but to go back and put in all these nuggets, it's frustrating to me because I'm sure there's nuggets that could be used in like five months. But it's also not time pressing for me to do. I, I need to help like the project teams move on. So I think that that's been a, that's a challenge. So I'm pretty sure time is a challenge. And then also just making sure, I think that everyone, like you said, can access it. We, we like other teams, we have Google Docs, we have Outlook, we have Airtable, we have, we have tons and tons of tools. And so staying on top of that, the reason I wanted to put the feedback into Airtable is because the product manager was already using Airtable and I linked the... I add the links that have my research evidence in Airtable to Clubhouse because the designers and the engineers are using Clubhouse. And so what I found in the past is you have to link it to wherever the teams are. And so that's in some cases I've used Wiki and Con Wikis and Confluence and other tools to do that. But I think that that was a challenge that I had. We definitely had that at sometimes with Polaris, like people could find information when it was either kind of given to them, but it wasn't directly linked potentially to where when they started the, those tickets or they were aware of it. So I think this is kind of a step forward that as a researcher, I'm actively helping to put that in. I know other colleagues do that. They put things into JIRA. They put things into the wikis. 
wherever designers and engineers are going to need to be acting on it. Is there anything that, what do you have to do to create the conditions where people are going to say, oh, I have this question, let me go see if there's any research that speaks to it? So the first stop would be probably talking to a researcher and saying, are you, are you even aware of that? And a researcher might say, yeah, I know we did some projects like that or talk to so-and-so. I think that they did that. What I'm trying to do is create the research wiki so that hopefully it could at least be by if those, those topics emerge or the personas that, again, because we're in commercial real estate, there's a lot that deal with brokers. So, but helping you find that, that right one, at least maybe, at least there's going to be, here's the place to start. And then here's, here's people you can talk to. I don't think sending someone to an Airtable database is, is the right way. I think that there's some type of, we're working, uh, we also have something in the works that we're going to be creating essentially a curated repository. And this was something that the other researchers and other people wanted where it is, here's journey, here's journey maps, Here's personas, here's information that we've all agreed is is okay to one standalone so someone who wasn't on the project can use and find. And then that we're gonna prior, we're gonna put that on more of a, a public not a public, but an internet site essentially linked to user research. And so but it will definitely be curated. And I think they might start there. So that's one more place. So even people, you know, being willing to say, Oh, I have a question, yeah. I should approach either researchers or internal research resources right? as opposed to, I don't know, doing nothing or... Yeah, I think the first thing was, is there is there a researcher or someone on your team or product team that's probably been doing that? They probably know or they can probably be a resource to get in touch with other people because, again, we do, we do monthly meetups. We're in touch with even designers might know if a project has been done or if you focus again on what was the, the user type and not the project and the code names, then you might actually say, well, three years ago, we did this, we did this type of work. And, you know, you might find value in that. And that's where eventually we want to go with um, almost creating these, like, as I said, it, talking to the other designers and research people that, that there would be an area that's curated is really important to us because I think that there's a thought that you could find all these random usability studies, you can find draft reports, but one, they don't, they may not have value to other people, you know, again, five months ago, even the, even the usability test I ran last week, the menu that we were testing has already changed in a week. It's, it's almost not, you know, the insights aren't relevant and that's fine because we actually changed the menu. And that's great, but I don't know that anybody needs to be able to access that forever. The project team, it's logged on the project team, but putting that into a research repository or something accessible by anybody, I don't think is is going to add value at, at this time. Right. I like the verb curation kind of attached to, <laughs> yeah. to research repository. It starts to make, starts to make sense right. given the complexity of the context you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how the team has evolved in your time here? Sure. So in terms of the broader the broader team, so when I started in November of 2018, there was someone uh, who was working part-time. She had been, uh, as, as a researcher, she'd originally been in support. She'd been here for two and a half years, and she'd kind of learned user research, and she was awesome, but it was also very self self-taught, but it was great that she had a user mindset. I asked her to give me kind of like just a background on what was happening and, and what what tools we had. And I asked her and we started with, well, what tools is, is everybody using? You know, even like even identifying, oh, there's Airtable. Oh, one group was using Optimal Sort. We have licenses and information. So, okay, again, this this kind of confirm people are doing things for user research, but, you know, maybe it's not organized or something. So, um, so we started to one, create that list. So we understood what tools do we even have access to? Do I need to buy tools? And then at the same time they started recruiting or they, they'd always been recruiting for that design director, as I said, who will start later in the summer. So that was new that there would actually be, again, a design director designs, designers had been re- reporting to a lead or a product manager, a product, a group product manager, but that was a change. So, and then also working more closely, I think with Seattle, um, instead of me just being focused on building up New York as a center of excellence, really trying to work. There was a, a lead researcher who'd been in Seattle who has since be, gone on to become a UX manager. He hired another researcher there. So there's, 
you know, for a few a few days, we had I think three or four people that were actually dedicated researchers. People that had titles that were different, changing. And I've been um, just last week, we had another researcher start here in New York City. So depending on how you're counting it, there's probably four or five people. Some people are part time and different levels, but there's within this build group, we kind of have finally this start of a actual user research team. And I say team loosely because it's not, we're not necessarily all reporting into the same people. We're, we're reporting up to the same SVP, but that's why I also see us more of a center of excellence. We're working. We have now some wikis, we have shared tools, we have a Slack group. When someone actually got a demo last week um, about a new tool we were considering, she's like, oh, I'm going to put this right into this this tools folder notes. And it was, I was so excited because we had that and we didn't have anything like that six months ago. And the other thing is um, it's been really exciting to see the product managers take interest uh, that I've worked with. Again, they, some of them have been doing jobs to be done. They've been doing different types of projects, but to see what they've been doing with, with their research. And in one case, we were able to also help create journey map that one product manager wanted said saw and was like, I can take this to my clients. So I think the impact on the team is like starting to actually say, here's what research can do and in ways that you didn't anticipate that maybe we could do that. So that was, um, so we're starting to change just the mindset potentially. You know, whether it's here or in yeah. other roles that you had, I'm wondering about, you know, when you look at people that are potential to join your team, what kind of things strike you about perspective, about researchers yeah. that might be prospective new colleagues? I think, I think you had to be super inquisitive and analytical. So are you, are you going to just take, hey, these are the top three problems and is that a given? I think that researchers and UX people tend to say, well, no, that's not the status. You know, we're going we're gonna to poke holes in that. So I think that's number one, being inquisitive and analytical. I also want to understand if they have, you know, do they have that user mindset? Are they able to understand you know, different perspectives. Have they done different types of projects where, you know, it's it's not just following somebody home, but it's like literally spending the time working with them. I've I've had the fortune to work across different types of product industries. In one case, working for a medical company, I was able to, I spent all day driving along with an oxygen delivery person, just knowing that you've had that chance to do field studies and that you haven't just been in a lab is, you know, is something that's really important to me that you have... I, ideally, you have wider experience than than sitting behind a desk. How do you yeah. like what what are sort of cues of like the user mindset? Like how does that um, exhibit? Well, it? I usually I I definitely like to understand if if they're presenting their portfolio or a case study. What was you know what were you really be, what were you asked to do? What was the actual request? And then what did you decide to do? How did you interpret the problem? And then what was who did you decide, like, how did you decide to approach this? But then who, like, what were really those key insights that really, what was the impact to that user, you know, beyond moving, again, not from a usability perspective, but from probably a higher level of like, here's really where they, they were having these these issues. You know, they couldn't, they couldn't figure something out. They were struggling to do that. Like, did they really then advocate, you know, as, as that key change kind of thing? Something wasn't, something's not right. We saw that pain point and then that became ideally one of the key insights that they hopefully informed a project about. And so maybe they had that big impact. So that's what I'm trying to say. It's like, could you see, can you see some of the challenges or even if it was like something that a user loved that you were able to take it from another place and say, we're going to impact, you know, this project or project with that, because that's so valuable. They get really excited about that. We don't want to ruin it. We want to make sure they can keep doing that or do that better. And did they have that user mindset, that user insight that they were then able to be that champion to take it through the project? You know, that's such a good point. I think we all and myself certainly get caught up in we're about finding problems and fixing them. Yeah, but right. your point, oh, if we find things that people love, those are huge opportunities yeah, yeah. to either right. protect or celebrate right, or extend. Right, right. It's, yeah, it's, it's easy to get lost in the fixing, we're here to fix stuff. I think so. And I think like, and then also having that, that freedom is suddenly sometimes different is like, 
we can, we don't have to only just fix stuff. We can make this better. They love it. Let's give them more. You know, that might not be a bad idea. Like, can we, can we make it so they can spend more time? I, I think in this case, like for a lot of the knowledge workers, let them do more time analyzing. Like if they're really good at coming up with the, these insights, they want to find the best office for their clients. Well, like they don't want to be just entering the data. They want to be re reviewing, you know, the images that we're providing, the analysis and let them do that. And that might be something that they love, that, that type of thing. <laughs> right. It reminds me of projects where the assumption going in was we were going to kind of remove steps and save time and remove effort. Right. And that you find that there's parts of problem solving yeah. of all sorts of weird parts of our lives right. that people find satisfaction or even like joy yeah. and delight in. Right, right. And that you know, our job isn't to just eliminate stuff, yeah. but right, like you said, there's parts right. of the work that right, are... Right, right. I remember interviewing someone when we were, I was working on like a, I think it was a small business and she's like, well, I love paying the employees. Like it took a lot of time, but at the end of the week, like she felt successful. She was happy to pay her employees. So even doing that, like understanding that step, like when she's using our product, but she's happy, it's not a chore. It's, you know, it's not a chore. She's like, she's happy to pay her employees. And she wants to re reward them. So like, I think having, you know, some of those insights and saying like, oh, this is a potential delighter. How do we, how do we build on that is potentially something to keep in mind. Right. That seems like a potentially a big reframe from, right. Small businesses don't want yeah. to spend money. Right, every, right. every loss is a loss. Yeah. Every, every out, out, outlay of money is a loss. Right. And this right. person's finding meaning in that. Yeah. Because of what it symbolizes to them right. and what, what, is, what accomplishment there is. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I love those things in research because you <laughs> right. then understand what you're really providing. Yeah. Yeah. So you've mentioned a couple of different uh, sort of like contexts like, you know, right. we're delivering oxygen and so on. Yeah. Can you talk about some of the other roles or maybe even right. just, you know, how you got into this work? Maybe we'll start back there. So my degree, I got a master's of science from Cornell. It's in like human environment relations with a concentration in human factors and ergonomics. And so when I started, uh, the internet was just, you know, was just getting started. I think I did my, my thesis, which related to actually some household tasks and products. And it was more about physical design. But I remember like I hand coded my survey because HTML was just kind of starting out. And I was, I was literally, they did, they didn't have survey monkey or anything. So I was, I was doing things like that. Uh, my first job after grad school was working for a Kohler company. They do kitchens and bathtubs, but I had the chance to work with a lot of really talented industrial designers. Eventually my career included working for the Consumer Product Safety Commission. And that's where I learned a lot about safety and some hazardous issues that could have been prevented because if usability and design had been better. The work there was more focused on standards, writing and, and reviewing. And it was it was really informative for me, but I wanted to go back to product development. Wait, what is the Consumer Product Safety Commission? Uh, this is a, a federal agency. You might know them because they do all the recalls. They also are the people that tend to put their, there's warning labels and different things that come out. There are a lot of voluntary standards. You might, they happen to appear a lot on consumer products, maybe baby, baby products in particular, but they ha affect a lot of different products. I remember looking at a, a gas grill that we, I think you bought on an infomercial and it kept kind of tipping over and the human factors and the usability perspective of that was like, it looked like you could light it in one place, but that actually wasn't where you could light it. Again, this was probably a really cheap grill, but the reality is from a human factors and design perspective, why wouldn't you light it in, in this one place? And when you lit it there, it actually caused accidents. And so uh, that had to be recalled, but that was a really different, I think, experience than a lot, a lot of my colleagues have had. And so that I was grateful for that experience, but I wanted to get back into product design. I eventually made my way to a medical products company, which was exciting because it was starting to blend the physical like products like sleep apnea and oxygen machi machines, which also had some digital screens and different, you know, just different types of products that I think today we take for granted. But back in the day, it seemed like things were either all digital and very maybe archaic, or they were almost all physical with just some lights or something. And so that was where I think it preceded the mobile phone but I had a sense of designing with, you know, kind of physical and digital at the same time, what we would call hardware and software today. But it wasn't always called like that. I was working with industrial design and product designers who were physical product designers at the time. How did you find uh, your, your program, your school program? How did you 
find your way to that? That I think was a fun story. I did my undergrad. I, I wanted originally uh, to study architecture. I spent a little bit of time uh, with kind of the intro architecture classes. I decided that actually I didn't want to be an architect. I wanted to be, I wanted to study the psychology. And I think I somehow understood more about designing for the people, but I didn't know anything about what it was called. And so I, I finished my undergraduate degree in psychology. And eventually I started just talking to people. I think the OXO Good Grips had come out. I think I did an interview. I, I think I did like an informational interview to say, what is this? Via? This seems really interesting. I think I called somebody and I think I got some leads. And eventually I remember just talking to everybody until somebody finally said, we think this is your field. And I think that there was a program, um, one was at Cornell, one was out in Wisconsin, and eventually, I think I just found these programs that said, this sounds like what you're doing. And I applied and I, I was lucky enough to get in. And then I, I found that program and, I, and that's how I, how I did that. So it was, um, it was definitely a researcher doing research to, to do that, but also um, really using your network and just saying, I think there's a way to make all these things easier. It seems like people are doing this. this. I know there's something related to psychology and design. I don't know what it's called, but I think there's something here. So people seem to be doing this type of thing. You know, hindsight is, of course, 2020, yeah. but is there a different path, given where you are yeah. now? Is there a different path you might have taken? I don't know. I From psychology, I mean, in terms of, I think, I, like I said, I wanted to apply it. Definitely. I could have gone to law school, you know, like done really, really different things. I think it would have been great if the UX program, if I'd been more aware of the UX programs, if things today had existed. But I think I kind of had to make my way through the career. And I'm happy that I got a chance to, again, like work on physical and digital and mobile products and things that I think it's because it was sort of me trying to figure it out. And maybe that's not as different from other UX people that, oh, this seems interesting. Maybe I can go work in this area or there's ways to apply this. Like, I think I think it worked out okay. I'm sure there's some analysis we could do of kind of, you know, when you, when you were in school or when you yeah. were sort of looking for your jobs, what you were aware of in terms of what kind of work there was yeah, and what yeah. kind of educational right, options right. there were. Yeah. Because, right, maybe if you're starting now, you have access to certain choices. If you started right. when you started or when I started. Yeah. You, you and I were doing different versions of finding our way with some serendipity and some sort of opportunistic research. But it's was a, the context was so different. I mean, I think I would also add, I think the assumption was I had this undergrad degree in psychology I was working, I think I just got a job, like I, I wasn't doing anything in the field. I was working in a publishing agency, which which was great, but it wasn't, you know, I was, I was really doing that to pay the bills, essentially. I didn't, had I been able to be an apprentice, had I found something else, maybe I wouldn't have gone to grad school. I think the assumption at the time was there's something out there. I think I probably assumed you had to get training and go to grad school. And so that's, that's the path I took. But potentially in this day and age, you, you might do more of an apprentice or you might join a bigger company and see if you can get training on the job in, in that sense. I mean, and just, you know, hearing your talk reminds me that there's a, a history of this profession. And, and, you know, relatively speaking, we're still yeah. talking about recent times, yeah. but, you know, it seems like the field goes back yeah. longer than we might, maybe we collectively forget the history. Yeah. De definitely. I mean, I, I think that's an unknown, right? That it goes back to people working on the planes and the pilots that, you know, the controls were in the wrong places and then they had to standardize, but that, that was really kind of the field originally of human factors. I think that a lot of the work that they were also doing, as I, as I understand it, probably with the early computers, even with NASA and things in the 60s, that was definitely pioneering the work of human-computer interaction, which sounds today so goofy to say human-computer interaction or human systems interaction, but it, it definitely it, it definitely goes back, you know, decades, way, way, way before us, you know, and generations. Right. You had a human you have a human factors degree. I have an yeah. HCI degree. Yeah. Yeah. You know, human computer interaction. Right. And those seem like rarer terms. I don't find people with that as their background as much. Right. Right. It's no, we, there was no, we didn't have the phrase user experience or UX or yeah. user research or any no, of those things. No. So yeah. we were finding our way. Right. I don't, I don't think I had the user research title until maybe like about 10 years ago. I think that's also when some of the industry changed a little bit, but that, 
people were doing task analysis. They were trying to understand the system. They were interviewing people. They were testing, whether they use the word usability testing or prototype testing or concept testing. They were essentially going through all the things that we do today. They just might have called it something different. I mean, in some of those sort of classic examples of human factors research and some of the things that these examples, there's just a lot of detail to sort of the decisions that are being made. Right. And, you know, a few minutes ago we were talking about, you know, reframing our understanding of what the problem is. Yeah. I mean, so there's a, you know, even if that's the, you know, there's other axes we consider, but just among that sort of detail versus big picture, it seems like there's a big range of what researchers do. Yes. I think, I think researchers have a really key role to play at both parts of the double diamond process. If you think of the traditional, you're trying to design the right thing. And can you inform that? What are the key insights? Are we going to build the right thing? Maybe researchers are helping to take those insights into a high level MVP. Is this even the right fit? But once you've decided to build the right thing, you know, are you building it right? Can you test multiple concepts? Are there three or four ways that you can actually figure that out? If it's totally new to the world, if it's even if it's a feature, maybe there's two or two or three different ways you can do a new feature. And then can you test that and iterate that? And so sometimes it gets into really detailed design all the way down to the icons, the placement on the page, the labeling, and all those other aspects that really go into refining a product and making a great product. And you like that part of it. I like both. Yeah. You know, I think I love the idea of really working at the upfront, doing really generative, informative research and going out and saying, you know, we've interviewed all these people, you know, what's really working, what's not, what's what's their workflow, what are like, what are things that nobody's found before and how, how could we maybe take this into something new? I love rap doing like rapid experiments to say maybe there's something we could do based on that and taking that into what you might call an early MVP but of course, yeah, I once once we do and I want to make sure, you know, things make sense and that it's really easy to use. And so that's that's still, you know, dear to my heart at the end of the day. You think about the user research profession or the practice, you know, whatever we kind of are collectively. Do you have any hopes or goals, you know, uh, in the sort of medium term for, for this field? I hope that we work more closely with all the different, I guess you would say, factions of user experience and design. I, On one hand, I love that there's a zillion different meetups and I can go on Eventbrite and see anything related to UX and research. On the other, um, on the other hand, I, I get bummed out that I'm like, oh, actually they should, they should have just talked to that other group. Like there's, there's a lot of groups. Um, there's user, the, the UX UXPA, there was IXDA, I don't know if they're still active, but there's so many groups that have either been active or could help some of these kind of what I'm seeing as random meetups. And I would love, I would love if some things got a little more organized or if there was just a way to say, you don't need a new Slack channel. You, you can talk to all these people. There are communities um, and letting people know. And maybe that's at a very high level, like just formalizing it. I, I've been, yeah, I've been in the field for a while. I, I, I don't like that. We're still, we still go in circles about what the title is. And so I'm okay not having the same titles and things, but I would love people to know, like there is, there is definitely a very long history of people doing this work and, and making sure that, that people have access to that and, and the resources. Yeah. It seems like we, I mean, as people and sort of certainly the technology profession, we have a short memory. Mm -hmm. We're attracted to kind of the shiny. And I mean, this was this was already a long time ago, but I remember someone telling me a story about, I think they were at an agency and they went in to talk to somebody about doing research and the person said to them, all right, what's new? What do you got? Yeah. And uh, like th even that, that idea that a thing that you're going to be doing with research should be new. I mean, obviously contexts change right. and we adapt to them. But just the idea that new itself was sort of a, was a value yeah. seems to sort of fly in the face of what you're saying. There's a whole history here that we're leveraging. We don't need to reinvent it. Right. Yeah. I'd probably be happy just to let every, if there was like a blog post or a tweet that says, hi, there's an entire history. Here's fields. If you're new and getting started, here's three or four fields that you might want to check out, related fields. Here's, you know, there's tons of templates and resources that people have been putting out over the years. Here's 
you know, here's 10 of them or something, something like that. And here's, if you're in anywhere in the world, there probably is a meetup that's related to what you're looking for. It just might be called UX or HCI or research or design research or something else. Right. All the variations of all the terms. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything else you think we should talk about today? Thing I didn't ask you about? I think this has been really positive. I'm looking to chat with anyone else if you're also trying to establish, you know, research as more of a center of excellence and building up the processes and the infrastructure that go beyond one team or or series of projects. I'd love for you to reach out. What's the best platform or whatever to for people to connect you on? We'll put it in the in the show notes for the episode. Uh, Twitter. Twitter's great. Okay. Well, thanks very much, okay. Michelle, for a great conversation. I really appreciate okay. your time. Thank you very much, Steve. Well, there we go. Thanks for being here for this episode. You can find Dollars to Donuts wherever you do your podcast listening. Didn't we used to call that podcatching? I don't know. You know you want to give us five stars on Apple Podcasts, am I right? Visit portugal.com slash podcast for all the episodes, including show notes and transcripts. Our theme music is by Bruce Todd. 